thank you all for coming to this meeting today as we prepare to wrap up the Youth Treatment Implementation Grant to share your lessons learned as an alternative peer group. Um, and so what we will do to start is have folks go around and introduce themselves. And we will start off with focus with Kayla Fortman, go to Carol Wood, and then end with Gabrielle Clem Clements. Hello, I am Kayla Fortman. I am the Executive Director of Focus Recovery and Wellness Group. So we offer youth services and our youth services are referred to as the loft, um, but we also do adult services and then have three recovery homes as well. And we are located in Hancock County. Hello, um, I'm Carol Wood. I'm a children's counselor and CPST provider for um, Cider Paint Valley Mental Health Center. Um, we have um, clinics in Pike, Ross, Pickaway, Fayette and Highland counties, but I work in the Pike Clinic um, and that's Waverly, Ohio, and we provide um, mental health and substance use disorder services to adults and children. My name is Gabriella Clements. I am the program specialist here at the Montgomery County Youth Resource Center which is a resource center for youth and young adults, 14 to 24. Uh, we provide all different types of resources um, for youth in the Montgomery County area. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to introduce myself and I will also let Joyce uh, introduce herself as well. My name is Kwanita McRoberts, um, and I'm the project director for the Youth Treatment Implementation Grant, where we get the opportunity and the privilege to work with providers across the state to make sure that services for youth and young adults to recover um, from mental health, substance use disorder, and or co-occurring are re available readily. Um, and also they get an idea of positive peer socialization through alternative peer groups. Um, and we have found that those are really, um, it's the backbone to connecting folks to um, the services and the resources. So we really wanted to get insights from folks. And I will share that and pass it over to Joyce. Good morning, I'm Joyce Calland with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and I work with Juanita on the Youth Treatment Implementation Grant. Um, all right, awesome. So I know that we will have a special guest also joining us um, with some direct experience with the youth from Loft. Um, her name is Tori, um, and we are getting that together with the technical side of things. Virtual has its side effects, of course. Um, so please bear with us. And the first question that I have, you know, just coming out of the gate of it is what tips do folks have for getting an APG up and running? Um, and we can kind of just popcorn that one. So if you feel that, I see Carol's mic is unmuted first. So we'll pass it to Carol. Goodness. Um, well, in, in getting that started, definitely uh, for me, it was making connections in the community or you know, going to those connections that I already had to get referrals um, because we needed to get the, the youth started, you know, coming. And I had never done, I've done mental health groups, but never had done an alternative peer group before. So needed to kind of keep that in mind, but definitely, you know, accessing the, the resources in your community, the contacts in your community to get those referrals. And then um, a lot of times having a, a good kind of structure, but then asking the youth like, hey, what would you like to learn about? You know, what would be important to you? What would be meaningful to you? Um, so for me, that's kind of how I maybe initially kind of started things. And then obviously we've talked before about the, the creativity needed during a pandemic. Um, so that was kind of like, um, like just learning to be super flexible, um, but still trying to maintain those contacts. Uh, flexible with the virtual, 
you know, trying to have virtual contact with youth, trying to um, send things through, uh, as you put it, snail mail, um, and, um, you know, just trying to maybe do good old fashioned texting or calling one for one on one to, to check if a youth hadn't been, you know, kind of connected in the group for a bit, just making sure that they were OK and if they needed anything or what we could do to get them kind of reengaged. But for us, that's kind of how how we had started things. I think for us, um, being able to partner with our Hancock County Adamus board has been the biggest help in getting it started. The funding stream from that um, has been a huge help in getting a downtown location. Um, they always are open to if they receive a notice of a grant that could benefit us, lets us know about it. Um, so we've been able to get new furniture, create murals that were relating to more of what the youth perspective, what they would like in the space. So that has been huge. I would say to get it up and running and get that foundation set, finding that funder is kind of the biggest thing. Um, and for us, it was our local Adamus board to be able to help with that. Um, and then they help get that community awareness out there and community buy-in because if they're in support of it, um, very much our community is in support of it and they see it as a need, otherwise they wouldn't fund it. So that has been a huge benefit for us to continue that sustainability, but also get that initial start as well. I think for me, um, Adamus has also been a, a great resource for us as well. Um, but trainings, I don't think I ever knew much about alternative peer groups until I did a lot of the trainings, um, like smart recovery and things like that. So um, I think it provided a great opportunity to learn more about peer support groups. So um, definitely training. And then, um, like Carol said, just a, a structure, um, having an idea of what you want it to look like before you go way steep in, you know what I mean? Um, and then having, we did have a um, contractor who was doing our APGs at first, so that was beneficial for us as well, so we can make sure we are um, maintaining that relationship with our youth, though it's now me and Lynn doing it. So either way, it worked out really well, but I do think it's beneficial to have as much training as possible on it um, and continuing education as well on it as well. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I appreciate your insights about being intentional and building an APG, getting that up and running, connection with the community and community resources. And to Carol's point that I do affectionately get call snail mail, you know, anything old becomes new again, right? Like we we saw that there was a need to connect the youth and the kiddos and with uh, a particular to this grant, one thing that I did not note is that this is for uh, more rural populations so that access to Wi-Fi and internet was not and may not still be for some of our youth readily accessible. So using things like the good old fashioned snail mail um, gave that reliability and the consistency. Um, so thank you all for so much. And on to our next question, what do you believe is the value of an APG in a youth's journey? I probably would say it provides a safe space. Um, what I, I have found with most of the youth that um, come to our youth resource center and APGs is they don't really have a safe space to talk about the things that's going on with them. They don't have anyone that um, can get on their level, so to speak, um, and be just there to listen and not give any type of um, reaction that would cause some type of traumatic response to it. Just being open um, enough with them. So I think that's the value. Awesome. Yeah, I would say for us too, that's similar. I mean, providing that safe space and the connection to a adult support system that maybe they don't have at their home or in their life. Um, 
you know, a lot of them open up about experiences that we don't hear them even open up to their treatment team about. And I think it's because they don't see us as writing it down and we don't have a treatment plan that we have to work towards steps each time. It's a conversation and then we continue those conversations. Um, and it's not about writing it down. We have to submit this document or get this treatment plan completed. Um, there's no mission to our day except to just have conversations with them and provide support. And we have groups, but the groups are just helping them to open up, kind of inch their way towards that. Um, but really, I think the magic does happen with the actual staff and the youth interacting together because that those conversations are huge. Um, we've had people come in from the treatment team in the in the past and said, you know, why aren't you redirecting some of those conversations about self harm? Um, and our go to is, you know, we're willing to have those difficult conversations. Um, we're not trying to redirect. We want to hear what they have to say and then support them on how maybe they can achieve what they want to achieve, which is they don't want to hurt themselves. They don't want to do self harm. Um, so then we, you know, started doing celebrations of milestones, like how many days did you go without? So those type of things where it's more about individual person, um, not about any goal of what we're trying to achieve that day, besides just giving them that space to be themselves. And, and definitely to piggyback on what you just said, Keila, definitely that, but a lot of our youth said, we can just be ourselves. Nobody judges us here. If we're having a bad day, we're having a bad day. And we'll, you know, everybody just kind of is, is safe. It's a safe, supportive place. But that, that like, nobody judges me. That kept coming up over and over um, in, in some of our conversations. So. And just to um, piggyback, piggyback off of Kayla, um, I hate when people, if I'm going to someone to talk about something important, I don't like when people like write things down. Don't I don't like to be social work as I call it. So just being able to provide that space where the book is closed, there's no, there's no book in front of me. Now, if I have to um, think about something or hear something that could bring up some abuse or neglect, then that's one thing. But um, for a youth to just be able to sit and just word vomit. And sometimes that can be a lot for us as the professional, but I don't, I don't like the idea of writing down every single thought. That's what counseling is for, right? And even when counseling, you don't want your counselor to sit down and write down every single word that you're saying. Um, so I think it, again, it goes back to just providing that safe space where they can tell you what's going on with them so they can move on in their journey of recovery. That was a perfect segue, um, Gabby, because our next question is around recovery and hearing some of the feedback that you all shared, Kayla, creating that safe space around that conversation with self-harm, right? How can people recover from those ideas if they've never had the proper space to explore and understand that there's other healthy alternatives, right? And I think we often have that conversation in a taboo sense or in a sense that's a little bit too late. Um, so that preventative nature so that people can get to see, okay, I'm feeling this in my body. And when I feel that, sometimes I might be having some thoughts about self-harm and inviting them to get curious um, instead of removing that shame and guilt in that conversation. Um, and then also to the other standpoint of feeling safe, safe enough to have those conversations. Um, so the next question is, how did APGs make recovery appealing? I think it's first for us was more of the education period. You know, I I think when you talk about recovery, it's still not full, fully developed um, in the youth's mind about what that is or if they're in recovery. Um, you know, I know when I was younger, no, you know, one of my family talked about recovery or addiction or mental illness. Um, and I didn't discover my own mental illness till I was an adult because of that. You know, I kind of suffered through it as a child due to that. So that's kind of what we're trying to do is more of the education and discovery of, well, maybe this is what's causing this or bringing in like NAMI or FRC or different um, outside entities that can maybe provide more of a process of identification um, 
because I think that is discovery period during that youth um, age range, and they're just trying to figure out what's going on. So I think for us, you know, we don't really make recovery appealing, but we try to help them discover what it is, um, what is recovery, what is maybe it's something that you're suffering from um, or dealing with, and how can we make make it a safe space for you to be able to discover that. So I think for us, it's less about the recovery, more about the discovery of what is going on in the youth life. I've noticed like the things that the information that we have shared, it's like they let it soak in and it may not kind of the light bulb might not kind of go off like right then, but like maybe in the few in the near future. And, and so I like that, like how you said, Kayla, just kind of letting them to, you know, kind of discover things. It's kind of like here it is and and we want you to like learn and make those connections, but we kind of let them do that on their in their own time. Um, I think for YRC, we, we really had to sit down and kind of figure out what would make it appealing and how how we can make this be fun. And um, I did like one of the um, activities that we did was vision boards. Um, and how does that go back to what your recovery looks like? And just small things about setting up goals for yourself um using a vision board I really um stuck with our youth like they really like the activity of doing vision boards we did a um activity where we did skits and um what would happen if your friend asked you to do whatever drug you're abstaining from what does that look like how would you what's a negative way you would react and what's a positive way that you can actually reinforce um you know, abstaining from any self-destructive behavior. So, and they really, really, really got into that. So if we can show them that it's not really, this isn't treatment. This is really, again, a safe space for you to, to really figure out what that process of discovering um, yourself looks like. So I, I think that really made it um, an appealing thing for them. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your insights. And I know we've had conversations about that before in meetings where we got curious about recovery with youth and also just, you know, stating, hey, adult solutions don't work for youth and young adults because they're youth and young adults, right? Um, and I'm going back to a conversation that we had from a previous meeting. Um, and thank you, Kayla, for, you know, bringing that to the forefront about how we've heard our youth stay, um, and, and Joyce always says this, and it's one of my favorite quotes about, it's more about discovery, right, rather than and even understanding the concept of recovery. Um, and I know that Kayla shared that some of the youth said they're living with it right now and they're concerned about how it can impact their future. So if you're just now getting the understanding of how mental health or substance use disorder is something that you are struggling with, what does that mean? How does that affect me in the future? And we, we have to create space for those things. We can't just say, now you recover, right? Um, and then we also know that we have to allow kind of like that childhood-like spark and curiosity um, to navigate the experience, um, understand the process of becoming resilient, discover a different possibility in life before heading to that recovery mindset. Um, I think from that feedback and the work that I've had the opportunity to do with peers has been the most successful for our youth. And um, just wanted to bring some of those conversations that we had uh, to the forefront. And so while we're on that recovery aspect, the next question I have is kind of like a dual question uh, going two ways from the standpoint of um, any insights on shifting that one dimensional, dimensional approach to recovery and also how to navigate when youth express loss and grief around recovery.
Could you go into detail about what you mean by the one dimensional approach? Yes. So um, to clarify, that's from that standpoint of like, if we think that recovery is one type of way and we only provide services that one type of way for the idea of recovery, right? We're not thinking of, for a lack of better words, the richness and texture of you know, what happens when we think 2D or 3D um, and really think about the intersections that maybe that's the word that I should say that a more intersectional approach to recovery um, and with all things considered. Does that help clarify? I apologize. No, you're OK. Yeah, it does help me. Um, I know when it comes to how we approach recovery, I think for youth, it's always about how do we engage them and how do we make sure that they're having fun while they're doing it? I think interactive games has been our biggest thing. Um, when we started working with different outside entities on education and things like that, they really brought a structure of this is a group setting, this is what you're gonna learn. Um, and that did no one wanted to attend, which I understand, especially if we're doing, you know, summer or after school hours, a lot of youth do not want to sit and just listen. Um, so when we do contract with people now, we make sure that we're educating them that our youth want to be engaged. They want to be able to have an approach where either they're writing something, doing a craft that goes along with the um, recovery, whatever message they're trying to bring or whatever education they're bringing. Um, I know one of the things that our loft lead and things does, they wrote a bunch of different questions on a beach ball and like they would throw it across the room. Now, I don't know why they find it so fun to throw balls in the room, but they do. And so like that was one way, you know, we saw them wanting to do it when we weren't playing a game. So we thought, you know what, we'll incorporate it into something where they can actually do it in a respectful way and it get something out of it. So making sure that we're engaging them and seeing what they want to do first, because um, I think, you know, all APGs have kind of mentioned this already is like really kind of understanding the youth perspective. What do you guys want to do? What do you find to be fun? Um, now we have cornhole in the building and create a game out of that. So anything interactive that we can do to educate and take that approach to recovery, we try to do in a fun way. Um, because I do think that's what keeps people coming back to the agency is making sure that we're doing it in a way that they want to come back and do it. Anyone else? Um, so what I did learn and um, continuing to learn that recovery has a lot of different um, layers, um, layers to it. So that one dimensional approach is not going to continue to keep our youth engaged. Um, so like I said, going back to all of the, ac the activities that we do um, is really important for us to always switch it up. Um, that's why it kind of sucked when we went virtual because we couldn't get that interpersonal um, intimate feeling of the APG. So it really um, is a lesson learned to really have whatever games and activities you have planned out. Um, because things like the pandemic can happen, um, not just planned out, but be able to do them in different ways as well. So how can we do a vision board um, with a kid being at home and over teams, right? Um, how can we do a skit over teams, right? So it really made us think on different levels on how we can continue to um, engage with them um, and not just be at that surface level of providing APGs. Yeah, definitely mixing it up keeps their attention, so. Awesome. Um, and I know I kind of asked a twofold question. So does anyone have any particular thoughts or feedback around youth feeling like there may be some concerns around loss or grief when it comes to the idea of recovery? Um, I know in particular that I'm thinking of our conversations about how youth have felt like, well, if I do this, I lose my friends, right? Or I lose the coping skill that I know right best that makes me feel better 
Um, anyone have any feedback or standpoint on that? Um, I would probably say as far as grief um, and going back to the friends, most of my kids come over to um, APGs because they're doing stuff like smoking marijuana and in their heads they're like, well, that's the least bad drug, right? Um, and all of my friends are doing it. So why do I have to stop doing this thing that is helping me cope? It only lasts for a second. So, but they don't see um, the impact that it can have on you not being able to have a job and how that is a cyclical effect of things. So um, their loss is more of having the loss of their social um, environment. Um, because if I can't do that with them, I don't have anything in common with them, right? But we have to really go back to saying, do you have something in common with them? Or is it just that thing that you do with them, right? Like, what do you actually have in common with them outside of doing that activity? So, and it really has them thinking like, oh my God, like, well, what about this person is beneficial to me? Right. And then that also brings up loss because then they think about not necessarily having the support system that they um, have in that group. Um, they can't go back home and talk to mom or dad or they don't have mom or dad and they're in the system because we deal with a lot of youth that are um, in the foster care system. So that is a, a way for them to cope with all of the other traumatic things that are going on with them. I think it's a big leap of leap of faith and to tr to trust, you know, I've seen that the the even though it may not be healthy, you know, whether you're using the other side is like you might, you know, like it's it's familiar, it's comfortable. So being able to trust that like like a change of like, you know, deciding to to can you know start and continue in the recovery is is not an easy choice for some. And like we had um, a youth in our Ross County um, APG that lost a friend from an overdose, you know? So you're talking about grief and loss from changes of friends and connections, but also just grief and loss from someone who passed that was a person in their life. And so that, that brought up a lot of strong feelings and just open conversation had kind of some activities planned that day and that was shared and you know be flexible we kind of set that aside and just had a real kind of deep meaningful conversation because some of our other youth in that particular group they may not have used directly themselves but they have family members who you know are in active use or recovery so you know, just brought up about a lot of opportunity to provide that particular use some extra support and just have some conversation about that. And I think for us, we've seen the culture shift of people wanting to attach to, you know, a mental illness or a diagnosis. I think the anti stigma is there um, more for the youth than it is adults still. But I think they get that message and then it becomes that they kind of attach themselves to it. So we've kind of had to, again, that kind of loss and grief of this is a part of your journey. This isn't who you are. And trying to convey that message to them has been a huge thing. Um, I just remember as a youth, you know, we would hide anything like that. So it, it is a culture shift in knowing that they are wanting to, you know, kind of say it and claim this is who I am and this is what it is. Um, that's a part of me. But instead of claiming it as a part of them, um, they really claim that as their self-identity. And we're really trying to make that, um, you know, change that perspective of, yes, it is a part of you. Yes, it is a journey. But when it comes to, you know, what is attached to that, making sure that they understand that that's not just the whole person, that's not them as a whole, um, and that they do have to kind of make those adaptions to make sure that the recovery process is there versus just kind of claiming, yes, I'm diagnosed with this and then stopping there um, because they claim that that, you know, again, that's a part of who they are. So just changing that culture shift, 
to make sure that they understand that it is a journey, that it doesn't just end with a diagnosis, um, making sure that they're aware of that. And then that loss and grief does sometimes come out because they attach so much of that. And that's kind of how they formed groups. Um, and then they create comparisons to other groups and say, oh, yours isn't as bad as mine. Um, and again, just making sure that that social awareness is there, that you cannot tell someone that yours is worse or theirs is worse um, because that's just invalidating their feelings. Mm -hmm. So that has that's a culture shift that I've recognized with the youth now um, that I did not recognize as my in my youth. Thank you, Kayla, for sharing those insights as well as uh, Kayla, uh, as well as others. Sorry. Um, one thing that I'm thinking about in particular to that standpoint is just like that grasp of like trying to understand your situation at hand at any means possible and even finding release it, relief in the sense of um, control that, OK, if I have this diagnosis, um, then this lets me know what's going on. And this may be a way that I know how to navigate X, Y and Z, but I appreciate this standpoint that you're saying you're more than this or even like, you know, connecting to a mental health professional to properly make sure that your concerns about that are valid. Um, and it just makes me think about how how the youth are trying to cope with the situation at hand in particular to our pandemic. So that's bringing us to our last round of questions. Is there any feedback from youth in the APGs during the height of the pandemic and even currently, because unfortunately we are seeing a resurgence in numbers um, that you all can feel, you feel that it's helpful for people to consider? Keep meeting, um, but do it safely, because you know, um, they they don't want to not have that contact, no matter what how what form it is. At least in our counties, they want to keep having some weekly connection. Um, so, um, like I said, they they say that it you know a few of them shared that it's 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 the one thing they look forward to the most for the for that week. Um, so Gabby, I think you were also gonna share something. Gabby, I think you were also gonna share something. Yeah, um I think for me, um just going back what to Carol said is um Figuring out a way to continue to stay engaged, even if that means us going back virtual. Um, and, and I know I've said this in previous conversations, virtual didn't really um, do for us well, I would say. Um, and I think that's just because they're used to coming in and having that personal um, interaction with someone. So, um, and then we also, again, um, are in a situation where not all youth have access to the computer, right? Or internet and things like that. So um, I did like the idea and you guys always said it's the snail mail and things like that. Um, or something that just as simple as a call to check in to see how they're doing. So um, virtual is hard. Um, it is doable, but we have to also think about the population that you serve um, and make sure they understand the technology if they do have it, right? Because we can say, hey, I'm going to send you this link via email, but if I don't know how to use my email, you know, how to make that easier for them. So um, meeting them where they're at is really the biggest take home for that is making sure you are meeting them where they're at. If they can't do it virtually, okay, think about doing a conversation over the phone. It doesn't have to be as long as a um, over the computer type of meeting. You can just call in and uh, make sure that they're doing okay. I think the biggest thing, we, oh my goodness, my voice. Um, I think the biggest thing for us that we've heard from youth is that during, uh, well, and still continuously through the pandemic, is just that isolation and boredom. Um, they really dealt with that a lot. And, you know, I know that 
Gabby, you've touched on that a lot too, was like virtual is hard because it is not as engaging. It's not as one-on-one -on -one as what we try to do when they're at the actual agency. Um, so I know we're trying, you know, trying to stay open for as long as we can. Um, we've only luckily had one person who had COVID so far in this whole experience out of the youth where we did have to shut down for a week. Um, but other than that, we've been trying to keep our doors open to them. And then something we've started talking about is if we have to adapt to something that is virtual, um, having some sort of game that we can link to that or having crafts maybe sent to the addresses that we have on file to be able to engage them and say, here's an activity instead of just listening um, and talking as a group. And then having that option for people to kind of have those side conversations as well, like giving us a call, making sure that we're available for, you know, via text during those open hours that we would have been open. Um, so far, we haven't had to go that route yet, but if we do, those are some of those ideas. Um, and it would be great if at some point, maybe there could be more virtual games or things like that for youth to be able to engage in their recovery online, um, because obviously online is definitely where youth tend to go more often than not um, for video games, multitude of things, but having something available. I don't know if you guys have resources or things like that, but having something available where we can engage them virtually um, and being able to do that. Yeah, it was interesting when we were doing snail mail back, like I said, back when COVID was in full swing the first time, trying to send, um, like one time I made copies because we had like resiliency bingo and different like games like that. Just making a copy of the page and then sending Hershey kisses for the place holders. <laughs> so trying to send like a little snack plus like a game too. So making it fun recovery is fun resiliency and discovery you know it doesn't it doesn't have to feel like oh not this again but yeah something very nice something fun and like you said consistent okay so um this next question is going to be around empowering youth um you know share anything that you all do to empower your youth and if you have an example or scenario where you've seen how a, a success story has happened or a client win, that would be really great if we can share that. I just knew a few of our um, girls in our in our Pike group have um, have shared that they feel more confident like um, in social situations with peers and that they um, I, I call them my uh, my welcome wagon because they like to tell other youth about like so if you if you're how you know if you want a great group to be part of come and be part of our group you know so they're out there kind of just sharing their own um you know their own good feelings and experiences so um just having them feel more confident about themselves and feel like they can talk more about things I, that's what i've seen that's kind of nice good success very nice kayla i, I believe you were going to go next yeah, I think for empowering youth, you know, having those conversations, allowing them to direct how the APG is going to run, um, what games we do, what activities we do. I think that empowers them to know that their voice matters and that they can actually have a say in what's being provided to them. Um, because their opinions don't just go that far. You know, we take it to the Atomist board because they always ask for what do the youth need? What are gaps? Um, what do we need to be, you know, what do we have to address in the community still? And we have found a lot of different things that are still need to be addressed for youth you know we have the higher end need where residential is something that we need for youth and we have the lower need where maybe more of a community center where it's more open to everyone because our apg is really more focused on making sure that we're providing groups that actually touch on recovery um, and obviously there's rules to the place when you come in to make sure that everyone feels respected and welcomed um, but making sure that they're included in everything empowers them completely um, and making sure that their voice is heard. And then, you know, successes for us is being able to have those connections treatment. We had one individual um, 
who has never been to counseling, but we now have um, FRC, which is Family Resource Center, come in, which is our local behavioral health agency, has their prevention team come in. Um, they already work in the schools. They're familiar with how to interact with youth, and they were able to have a sign-up sheet for individuals. So you can do the six free sessions or six sessions until you need parental consent. So having that capability for them to be assessed at the loft, you know, again, the accessibility, having that person engage them there. Um, we've had someone screen. We have ended up having that person screen and then they went into counseling sessions. Um, and from there, we've had two more that were screened and then has the option to go into counseling sessions with FRC. So those are some of our successes is making sure that they're connected and making sure they're discovering what it is that they need to discover to make sure that their future is set up for the right path. I think that has been some of those wins that we've noticed and just conversations, more openness, more openness from the youth to actually identify things that are maybe going wrong in the home or things that are going, um, that they're struggling with in life. You know, I talked about self-harm because we've had a lot of individuals come in um, with that similar capacity, like that's their only avenue to release. So when they open up about it though, it creates discussions and makes sure that people know that it's a safe space to be able to discuss things like that. So that also empowers them to know like, hey, I can come in and have any conversation with the staff and they're not going to judge me. They're not gonna write it down. They're not going to you know, tell my parents. Um, it's really a discussion between the loft lead um, and the youth, so that trust is there. Awesome. Go ahead, Nancy. I think so for me, it's, it's the small things um, that really make me happy. And I, I'll keep going back to this story about this young lady. But for me, the fact that she is continuing to reach out mm -hmm. um, that for one empowers me okay because i know that i'm doing something right but it also in turn empowers her because she's able to use her voice to say hey i need help right so it's the small things for me <laughs> the small wins so um i again i want um all of our youth to feel like they have the opportunity to have a voice in what their recovery looks like so when i have a youth reaching out to me um even if it's not about recovery i feel like that's an empowering thing for them to be able to ask for help because even as an adult i don't like to ask for help okay so um that pride gets into the way so for her to be able to remove um that pride out of needing help it, i think that's empowering for me I love that. Thank you. And it is the small things, too, because when our youth need some support and some help and they know that they can turn to someone, that's what matters, right? Like, all of these things are great things, small and large. Um, so to wrap things up and land our plane, is there any lingering lessons learned that you all would like to share, maybe about virtual community or gaps noticed in community? or any other things that you may have? I think for us, it was about having, uh, if I could go back, having a better foundation set before we opened up the downtown location. Obviously, we didn't expect the influx in numbers, um, but once they came, you really kind of recognize the gaps and the cracks in the foundation a little bit more. So I think for us, you know, a recommendation, obviously having those behaviors, what's acceptable, what is not listed out very concisely um, and having those consequences listed out because there was always questions for the consequences of, well, when do I notify parents? When do I do an incident report? Um, what's a discussion? When should they be told to not leave and how long should they leave for? So there was a lot of open-ended questions that really started bringing more of uh, my program manager into those discussions and then taking her time away um, because she does the adult and the youth services um, program. So having those clear cut things where there's less questions for staff, um, having that foundation set is definitely useful. And then making sure the parents are engaged in some way um, before we you know we're starting to do parent night, we're starting to have a welcome packet for parents so they know about the agencies coming in, what we provide, 
pictures of the staff so they know how to identify us. Um, so all of those things, you know, we're really trying to set up a better foundation so the parents feel, feel more at peace about what's going on at the agency. Um, and then the youth that are coming know what to expect and what behaviors are expected out of them. Um, because we did have a lot of youth kind of leaving things around, not really picking up after themselves, um, thinking that it was kind of just free reign. So once we did rein that in and put out that list, um, we started having more of a select group of people that came and kind of understood what it was we're providing. We're not providing just a hangout center. We are providing a safe space, but we're also providing a respectful place for everyone to feel welcome. So once that's out there, you really kind of get in the youth that need those services and want to be there for the right reasons. So I would recommend that, you know, as the foundation's being created, just making sure those those things are listed out very clearly for the youth and the parents. Awesome. All right, well, I will say that that concludes our recorded session um, for our lessons learned around APG. I came up with a fun, fancy title also, you know, for those that made it to the end, this has been Connecting the Dots with APG, a non-linear approach. <laughs> It's been a pleasure working with you all. Thank you all so, so much for all of your insights and taking time out to share these details and have a great rest of your day.